The first presentation is by Professor Blandi from Bristol University, United Kingdom, Modern Methods in Igneous Petrology. When do you want me to finish? I'll just keep going till you've had enough of me, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, good morning. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me. Uh, I apologise for the very bland title of this presentation. As uh, it was uh, done in a hurry. Obviously, it's modern methods in English petrology. I was a lecture on old-fashioned methods in English petrology. That would be pointless. Um, do I have a pointer? Pointer? Ah, oh, I can give you. Uh huh. Can you press this one? No. Okay. Right. Okay. And I, I like the answer. Oh, yeah. So, um, what I'd like to try and do today is, is, is just give you an overview of some of the work that we're, we're doing in, uh, in Bristol uh, with, with collaborators around the world, trying to get a, a holistic view of crustal magnetism that integrates petrology and geochemistry and, uh, and, and geophysics and challenges some of the, uh, the, the long standing views about how crustal magnetism works. Yeah, I'm just thinking about Okay. Magnus of both 
mantle and uh, crustal origin. Why do we need a transcrustal marsh? What was wrong with the magma chamber? I think the thing that's become clear to me uh, over the last 10 years or so is that as petrologists we should listen to geophysicists and, uh, and, and vice versa. And the fact remains that our colleagues in geophysics can't find any magma chambers for us. They can't find large volumes of molten rock in the continents. There are skinny, thin uh, axial magma chambers beneath uh, the East Pacific rise, but in continental settings, large volumes of liquid rock that cannot transmit S waves are very, very elusive. And so we pretend, sort of in the ignorance of each other, that these things exist, but geophysics tells us that they don't. We also know that many magmatic systems are extremely long-lived. We have very high resolution zircon dating that tells us that a magma system needs to reside for a very long time. And it's very hard to have long-lived systems at very shallow level because they're losing heat constantly. It's much easier to maintain long-lived systems at greater depth in the crust. And that's the second point. If we're going to do most of the differentiation at shallow level in the crust, we're going to have to have rather a lot of dense cumulative rocks really um, at uh, depths commensurate with the magma chamber, like just a few kilometers or so. And on the basis of gravity alone, we just can't see very large uh, positive Bouguer anomalies at a shallow level in the cross. We also know that when we look at the, the chemistry of magmas that come out of, uh, of volcanoes, they often show evidence of polybaric differentiation. That is, they crystallize over a range of depths from the deep crust to the shallow crust, and that's hard to reconcile with a single body at shallow level. We have to melt the crust. There's lots of evidence for the involvement of crustal uh, melts in continental magnetism. It's hard to melt large amounts of crust if you're doing assimilation at shallow level at the same time. And also, as I shall show at the end, and this really has some relevance to uh, hydrothermal ore deposits, when we look at volcanoes, we often see a decoupling of when melt or magma is coming out and when gas is coming out. So I hope what I'll show you is, a, is an integration of petrology and, and, uh, and, and geophysics. So here are some implications I hope we can go through um, this time. Uh, architecture of subvolcanic systems, why volcanoes are the heights they are, what the roots of volcanoes will look like, I'll show you some uh, samples from the West Indies. What zone volcanic crystals can tell us about uh, crustal magmatic systems? And if time permits, what we can learn about hydrothermal ore deposits. And uh, I, I put the collaborators for each of those projects there, and I hope you'll notice there's lots of Russian names there, so I feel this is an appropriate setting. Not all of those Russians live in Russia, though, I should, say. I should point out. Okay, so TCMM. TCM, I made that up last night, a transcrustal magmatic mush, what's it look like? The best example in the world, by some distance, is one that underlies this region of the Altiplano, it's Chile, Argentina, Bolivia. This is the Altiplano, and there's a very large geophysical anomaly beneath the Altiplano, at a depth of about 15 to 20 kilometers, that's called the Altiplano Puna Magma Body. It's a geophysical anomaly because it has reduced uh, S-wave velocities and it's very conductive and as I shall show, it actually has uh, reduced density. It's not completely molten. It's partially molten. In fact, as I shall show you, it's around about 10 or 15 percent melt. It's huge. It's far and away the biggest, uh, uh, I can put the volume on there, it's about half a million uh, kilometers. And it ranges, it, it reaches from uh, the, uh, the west, the Arctic margin, uh, and the margin of the west, somewhere into the uh, eastern edge of the Arctic planet. It underlies a series of volcanoes, and I'll show you this volcano here, Oops, Oops, down to Oops, Oops, Oops. and its base is not very well defined, but the crust in this region, as you probably know, is the thickest anywhere in the, in the world today, about 70 kilometers. And what lies above the APMB is something called the Altiplano Puna Volcanic Complex, which is a series of volcanoes 
most of which are dormant. There were some very large ignimbrite forming, uh, I've lost my audience already, uh, ignimbrite forming eruptions during the Miocene, but there's no uh, active uh, volcanism uh, today in this region. Okay, so that's, that is one of these deep crustal uh, magma systems. Let's have a look at its surface expression. There is Serra Uttarunku, a fabulous volcano rising 6,000 meters uh, above sea level. Um, and the base here, the Altiplano, is about 1.5-1.6 kilometers below. This is a very interesting volcano because throughout its volcanic history it has been exclusively effusive. There is not a single pyroclastic rock on this volcano at all, and we've been several times to look. It produces lava flows, some of these lava flows here, and domes, some of them are a bit hard to see, but there are domes up near the summit. It produces basically effusive uh, day sites. And the chemistry of those day sites is extremely monotonous. There's a small variation in silica content, but really uh, it's pretty much produced the same stuff in an effusive way throughout its history. One exception, a small quenched uh, inclusion is about so big of andesite. They have a significant cell content just above. So they're chemically monotonous and they have a very distinctive uh, phenocryst assemblage of uh, biotite, ilmenite, plagioclase, orthopyroxene, magnetite, glass, and you can't see into there, there's also uh, quartz and apatite. We've dated uh, the lava flows and the domes and we mapped the uh, volcanic edifice so we get some idea as to how the volcano has grown over time. The volcano, the oldest rocks we can find, I'm sure there are older buried, but the oldest rocks we can find are 1.05 million years old. And the volcano continued to erupt until uh, 0.25 or 250,000 uh, years ago. And there's no evidence of volcanism since then, although there are active fumaroles at the summit. But actually, there's a sulfur mine at the summit, and uh, unlike the Alpinist we heard about earlier, you can drive to 6,000 meters, which is a lot easier climbing. And we can see this is the age of different samples, this is the cumulative volume, and we can see that although the volcano grew over this period, it grew in pulses. There's a pulse here, then a hiatus, then a pulse, then it slowed down, and then it's done nothing for the last. And so we could say the discharge is episodic, and there are periods of relatively high flux, and periods of relatively low flux, and periods of dormancy. We can use the, uh, the rocks themselves, the, uh, the, the day sites that are erupted, to say something about where the magma was when it was last erupted, where it was stored before eruption. So, if we start just with the, uh, the temperature, this is the temperature and the, uh, the oxidation state, these are some well known uh, reference uh, curves for, for, for the oxidation state, we can see that the magnets are erupted over a range of temperatures, 800 to 900 degrees, which is, which is quite significant, and they have a range of, uh, of oxidation states, but they're not that atypical for iron magnets. In terms of their volatiles, this is an important point, they're rather water poor. These magnets only have about 3.5% water, this is the water axis here, and modest amounts of, of carbon dioxide up to about 400 million. Because we know the solubility of water and carbon dioxide is a function of pressure, we can deduce that this volatile content is consistent with a pressure of 100 megapascals or a kilo. That's pretty shallow. And finally, we can um, use experimental geology. We can try and recreate that mineral assemblage, those mineral uh, compositions in the laboratory. And this is my uh, former PhD student, Dr. Muir. And these are the stability curves of different minerals. This is temperature and pressure. We're aiming to have orthopyroxene and biotite, and that's that little skinny volume there, which again is giving us a pressure of about 100 megapascals, although there's some uh, slot in that value. So what the day sites tell us is that these magnets were last stored, they last equilibrated at shallow level beneath the volcano. 
So geophysics says there's something very, very deep. The petrology tells that the magma at least just before eruption was stored in shale. The picture that emerges here is that this system at shallow level was formed by repeated incursions of daytime magma into a shallow reservoir. There are heating and cooling cycles that are recorded in the temperatures of eruption, but also in the breakdown of some minerals. The day site is rather water poor, and that may be significant in terms of uh, the explicitity of this problem. Volatile saturation is at about 100 MPa, and I've mentioned before these hydrous andesites that form these little maybe uh, enclaves or maybe inclusions. The striking thing about those is they have really, really calcium plagiclase, a norphite 85, 85% a mole percent of the anorphite component. We have an image then of the magmatic system, and this is from, uh, from a paper of the uh, Duncans. This is the shallow storage region where the magma is last equilibrated. This is the APMB, that uh, geophysically anomalous deep uh, body. And we infer that magmas that erupted at Arunga were generated here, ascended, equilibrated briefly before eruption up here, and then emerged onto the surface. So we are invoking a connection between the shallow system and the APMB. This is the distribution of earthquakes today. So we don't know the distribution of earthquakes 250,000 years ago. What's in the APMB? Well, this plot on the right shows two different ways of working out what's in the APMB. The first way, which is the top plot here, is to say the conductivity of uh, the APMB as measured by uh, Magnetotelluric uh, magneto um, surveys is uh, one c meter, and we've then made this is we call the made measurements of the electrical conductivity of andesites with different amounts of water, andesites similar in composition to these little maybe inclusions, to see how much of that andesite we would need. What is water content? Be to match the conductivity of the APMB. And in fact, we find that we need a melt fraction of about 10% and a water content of about 9%. So we need a very, very wet andesite to match the electrical conductivity. And I should say that we can't do it with any other uh, melts. They're less conductive. We need an awful lot more, and that doesn't really fit with the uh, wave velocity. There's another way we can assess what's in that um, APMB. I've mentioned we have these little blobs of andesite, and they have a very distinctive mineral assemblage, including very, very classic magiclase. And in the, ex in the laboratory, we've tried to reproduce that very classic magiclase, and in fact, the rest of the mineral assemblage. And we find here are the experiments, the green symbols. To get 85, we need 9% water. So we actually agree that what resides in this deep crustal system is an andesitic melt with nine weight percent water. And that has a lot of implications for the amount of uh, volatiles that will be discharged as this body uh, evolves. And uh, just to give you an idea, the total amount of water dissolved in the melt in the Arctic plant cool mammal body is equivalent to uh, So it's an entire underground, mid-crustal Great Lake. I'm not going to dwell on this slide other than to say that it's not just andesite down there. The andesite is at 980 degrees, it contains a lot of water, and it actually melts the crust above it. And we know it melts the crust above it, so imagine Hot here, this is the older crust, this depth is more like 15 kilometers. There's melting that takes place of the crust here. And we know that that's taking place because if we look at the strontium isotopes, we have day sites, these are the here. We have day sites, 
but they're very, very radiogenic in terms of their strong genes. So that tells us that this region is a place not only where magmas are crystallizing, but where they're also uh, melting the crust. So we are fueling this region with basalt from the mantle that differentiates to produce very hydrocanthazites that supply heat and melt the crust. And here are just some uh, thermal models from the old paper of Annette. I won't go into the details. But the point is that in the deep crust, because you're putting heat into a relatively insulated environment, you uh, differentiate by crystallization, also by melting the crust. Okay. There's the, uh, here are various geophysical images. Let's not go through the details, but the point is, I think this is probably the best geophysically imaged uh, deep crustal magmatic uh, system anywhere in the world. We have, uh, this is uh, uh, ambient noise uh, tomography, this is magneto tellurix, this is geodesy, there's a big region of uplift in the surrounding region of, 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 of substance around the tellurix. We've done a gravity survey. These are uh, low um, uh, density bodies. That's what you're through here. And all of them show some sort of a connection from deep up to Uturunku. It's less clear. There's less resolution in the ambient noise tomography. The gravity, obviously rather non-unique technique, but we can see low density uh, fingers extending from a depth of about 15 kilometers up into the volcano. We're getting images of this system, the system that connects the APMB to the shadow level and ultimately to the volcano itself. And there are a number of interesting um, things we can do with that, with that configuration. If we go back to the geological map, we see that the youngest magnus, shown in the pale uh, colour, are close to the summit of the volcano, and they're all rather short flows. And the older lavas, are around the periphery of the volcano and they're much longer flows. They come from the same depth, but they flow further. The other thing we notice is that uh, this is Uturunku, uh, this is uh, Sonicera, this is the Altiplano. These are just two dormant volcanoes. These are the volcanoes of the Altiplano. There's Uturunku, Sonicera would be there. These are a bunch of others. We'll just take these on Google Maps. They have an average height of 1.3 plus or minus 0.4 kilometers above the Altiplano. Some of them have been decapitated by erosion, or Turunku's a little bit damaged at the top. By and large, all these volcanoes are the same, are the same height. And that's rather interesting if we think about a very simple system where we have buoyant magma deep in the crust, and we have uh, denser crust lying above the buoyant magma. We would expect in a system where there is a connection but there'll be some relationship between the depth, the composition, and the density of the magma, and the height of the volcano. So we might imagine that the height of the volcano is controlled by the depth, and by what's in the magma chamber. It's a very simple relationship. We're in a fortunate position because we don't have to speculate about the water content, and the temperature, and the composition. We we have a complete set of experiments that we could use to turn uh, magma composition and crystal content into density. We can actually calculate the density all the way up. We have a less good constraint on the density of the crust. This is uh, a regionally average density variation of depth. And so we can actually, rather than use this very crude method, we can actually integrate the density difference all the way across the crustal length. And we can calculate the height of the volcano in different ways produce different answers, but they're always about 1.6 kilometers. So what we think is that this volcano continues to grow to a height that matches that density contrast beneath what's at the top of the APMB and, and the crust around. And what that opens up is the possibility that if we disturb Uturunku, if we, for example, destroy the edifice, it will over time try to reconstruct that edifice. And it leads to an idea of top-down volcanism, where actually the magmatic system may be controlled by what happens at the surface. And one interesting uh, possibility is that this change in um, output rate here, around about 600,000 years ago, might correspond 
to particularly intense uh, glaciations in the region. You can sort of see this if this is the uh, oxygen isotope curve. I won't go into details for why, why we see a change in the intensity of glaciations around about six or seven hundred uh, thousand years ago. But one possibility is that this is a response to partial destruction of the edifice and then the uh, renewed uh, growth. Okay, let's now move to a different volcanic system uh, to try and understand what does all this look like or what does a what does a, a transcrustal magmatic marsh actually look like if we got our hands on a piece? We have just, I've just shown you geophysical imaging. Well, the best place to go for samples of transcrustal magmatic mushes is the Lesser Antilles. Lesser Antilles is a chain of volcanoes. Uh, this is in the Western Atlantic, in South America. Uh, this would be. Uh, Florida up here in North America. And this chain of volcanoes that correspond to westwards uh, subduction of the, of the Atlantic beneath the Caribbean plate. And these volcanoes are well known for their crustal sediments, plutonic sediments. And I've now been to every single one of those islands, it's been very hard work. Uh, but um, we've collected more than a thousand uh, crustal sediments all along the arc. Some of them, as you can see here, are really, really very large. Many of them are rather small. It's the biggest collection of crustal uh, uh, plutonic zenoths of any volcanic arc in the world. And um, I'm very keen to share that collection and, and to collaborate with anyone who's, who's uh, interested. The key thing about these uh, samples is they are very, very rich. All that black metal there is amphibole. The volcanic rocks of the lesser activities never contain any amphibole at all with a few exceptions. And yet, the samples of mush, partially molten rock, are abundant in that region. Here's a rather nice, this is a Kremskan image from a former master student of mine. And we can see um, pale blue plagioclase, yellow olive, green plant parasite. So that's a troctolite or a gabbro. And then this browny red color here is hornblende. And we see the way in which hornblende imprints itself on top of an original uh, anhydrous mineralogy. And I'll show you just four more uh, samples here. In each case, we can see these big plates of hornblende, these are the plagioclases, uh, olivines, and plant uh, pyroxenes. This is from St. Kitts. This one's from Beckway. We can see a uh, rather interstitial amphibole here filling the gaps between the crystals. This is also from Beckway. We can see these huge poikilocrysts of amphibole that are overprinted on an earlier um, anhydrous mineral assemblage. And then here is Grenada, that's a, a rather idiotized olivine and pyroxene uh, and plagioclase. One of the things about transcrustal magmatic mushes is we would expect them not to be static, but expect melts to percolate up through the crystalline framework modifying the mineralogy as they go. And those melts, as I've shown, are very, very water-rich in the case of the Andes, and the products of that reaction is amphibole. So anhydrous uh, minerals plus uh, hydrous melts will give us amphibole. What pressure is all that happening at? Well, we, I have a postdoc, Lucas de who is developing uh, barometers. The way these barometers work, this is not an empirical barometer. What we're actually doing is we're taking uh, the internally consistent thermodynamic, thermodynamic data set, you probably know, known as Thermocal from Holland and Powell. We have a series of reactions. We select appropriate reactions for the mineral assemblages we see. And then we look for the intersection of those reactions in PT space. Now what we've done is rather than use the, uh, all of the thermodynamic parameters from the Holland and Powell data set, which are optimized for all of the uh, composition space, we focus on just those minerals that we get in these uh, assemblages. And what we've done is we've recalibrated Holland and Powell for the specific set of reactions and mineral assemblages that occur um, in the lesser Antilles cumulus. And I will go through this slide in detail. But what we've done is we've taken all of the experimental literature where we have uh, these mineral assemblages 
In this particular case, assemblages that contain olivine clinopyrus and plagioclase, or olivine clinopyrus and plagioclase and spinel. And these are all the experiments out there. We've made quite a lot of experiments of our own. We've recalibrated and we've refined the activity composition relationships. We won't go into details on this. I just want you to be reassured that this is not an empirical approach. We're trying to actually develop a robust thermodynamic approach. Here's one example from Grenada. What we've done is we've found patches of this rock where olivine, planet pyrus, and snail are in contact. There's a lot of amphibole in here, but we've found little islands where uh, these, uh, that's uh, olivine, planet pyrus, and plagioclase, uh, olivine, spinel, planet pyrus, and plagioclase. We found places where they coexist, and we calculate uh, the average pressure from two different barometers. We're getting around about three kilobars, and one of uh, Luca, the postdoc's tasks is to calculate the pressure for all 1,000 cubic satellites and to get an image of what the, uh, the crust looks like beneath the activities. And I was very. One of the problems here is we don't actually have a really good thermometer, which is why I was very interested in uh, Alex Sobolev's um, uh, thermometer between olivine and Spinel, because that would give us an independent constraint on the, uh, on the temperature. Okay. So, we've got geophysical images of a, of a mush. We've got petrological samples of a mush, and they are far from around the right depths, 7 to 14 or 2 to 4 kilobars. I haven't determined all the pressures yet, but we're looking at sort of mid-crustal uh, depths, much thinner crust in the Antilles, of course. Now let's focus on that process of getting from the mush to the volcano, that, that connection. And I'll now turn to a third field example, which is Mount St. Helens, a volcano in the western United States above the Cascades, uh, volcanic arm. Oh, there's, 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 there's Mount St. Helens, the uh, Nazca plate, sorry, the uh, Juan de Fuca plate is subducting like so, and St. Helens and Mount Adams are, are roughly uh, uh, along a line perpendicular to the trench, and this is again a magnetotelluric study. This is showing resistivity now, so uh, low resistivity here is some sort of deep uh, melt layer. There's currently a big project to refine that. This square should move over here, sorry. Uh, but we've got a deep transcrustal magmatic mush that appears to be linked to St. Helens and Mount Adams by one or more of these uh, columns. This is a close-up of that region there. This is an older uh, image where we can see the distribution of earthquakes appears to define uh, earthquake core regions that are often thought to represent uh, magma storage regions or little magma chambers, if you like, little regions where the magma functions. So let's see if we can learn something about the process of moving melt from here to uh, erupt and melt. So we're going to look at the center melt and the deep. So, to get some insights into the, uh, the ascent process, we're going to look at textures, the testimony of textures. These are plagioclases, the different greys are different uh, amounts of the amorphite and albite uh, uh, components. These are beautifully zoned plagioclases, and I always think that zoned minerals like this are like uh, mute witnesses to some event. They're trying to tell us what went on before they erupted, they just don't know how to tell us, we have to work out how to ask them the right, the right questions. There's an awful lot of information locked in these zone crystals. And I'm just going to focus on the more normal zone crystals like this, rather than the real weirdos like that. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we could interrogate an individual crystal and get it to reveal its, uh, it, its life story, if you like, if we could ask the right kinds of questions. Mount Nellis is a really good place to do this. Firstly, it's a very, very well-studied volcano. We have very good constraints on the uh, phase relations, the relationship uh, between temperature and pressure in terms of mineral stability. There are a lot more data than this. I've had 
several PhD students refining these phase diagrams. We've got very good constraints on mineral composition. So, for example, in terms of plagioclase, we can parameterize the composition of plagioclase as a function of temperature and as a function of pressure. These are different pressures here. We see a variation between both temperature and pressure. And best of all, Mount St. Helens, a bit like Otterung Group, is a very, very monotonous volcano. There are some uh, slightly more exotic rocks, particularly cumulate uh, zenoliths at Mount St. Helens, but over its last eruptive period, it pretty much just produces daysight. So we can tend to view it as a relatively closed system, and that's really rather important. Okay, so in principle then, we could just take a parameterization of plagioclase composition in pressure temperature space. These are lines of an all 30, 35 and so on. That's the liquidus and that's the solidus. And we can say, right, we've got a zoned crystal. How do we move across PT space? Well, you can see straight away there's an ambiguity. Let's imagine that was our zoning. Well, we can achieve that zoning by going that way, dropping the pressure, or we could achieve our zoning by going that way, dropping the temperature. So the path is not uniquely defined. Let's imagine now that we can add another variable. You'd say, well, there's a difference in the water content between here and here, but not a difference in the water content between here and here. What if we could get the water content of the coexisting map? Well, here are contours of water content. And then we might be able to do something a bit more with the zoning. We could say this is a drop in water content, whereas this has the same water content. We can, in principle, measure the water in a plagiarist place, and we can use that to determine the magmatic water. That's not very straightforward, and there are some issues with the relatively rapid diffusion of water. So I haven't been able to do that. Let's try something else though. Let's look at melt fraction. Let's contour that same plot for the melt fraction. These are lines of constant melt fraction. 100%, 80%, 60%, 40% and so on. The lines of melt fraction or crystallinity are oblique to the plagioclase composition. So there's a difference then in going this way and that way in terms of how the melt fraction changes. So, if I had some means to use the pressure phase to determine the melt fraction change from one zone to the next, I would be able to distinguish between the case where the pressure drops and the case where the temperature drops. And the way to get a handle on how the melt fraction changes is to measure partition coefficients. To measure trace elements where we know the partition code. So what we've done is we've started the program of analysing trace elements and anorthite across zoned plagioclase crystals. We're going to make the assumption that the system is closed and we're going to navigate our way through pressure, temperature, melt fraction space. So we make measurements with iron probe from the rim to the core. We look at the zoning in an orthite strontium bearing. We assume the system is chemically closed on the scale of an individual eruption. We assume that growth occurs at equilibrium. I'm happy to address questions on that if they want to concern. We'll assume that there is no diffusive re-equilibration. We'll actually demonstrate that quite convincingly in the case of strontium. These crystals, as you should see, can't be very old. There's been very little diffusive re -equilibration. We know the partitioning of uh, strontium and bearing between plagioclase and melt as a function of composition and temperature. That's from a paper that I'm drafted over. I've got the parameterization of plagioclase composition from all those many, many experiments and melt fraction. My chemically closed system is going to have the composition of the bulk magma erupted in 1980 to 86. I'm going to use plagioclase and melt thermometry to get the temperature of the starting point. And then what, uh, I should say, what I, this is actually uh, uh, a collaboration with Oleg Melnik, what Oleg does, and, uh, what Tasha do, is they then uncrystallize this crystal. 
they start at the end and they work out what amount of crystallization must have occurred to get from that point to that point and then that point to that point. So they progressively uncrystallize the crystal. They maintain mass balance in the system at each increment. They recover the pressure, the temperature, the melt fraction, the proportion of the crystals that are hydroglazed, and the composition of the melt in terms of structure and bearing. As well as having all those experiments, I've also analyzed just over 700 melt inclusions from Mount St. Helens for their water contents and trace elements. So we have a very good handle on how melt varies in this system, and the solutions here are optimized to melt, to, to match the melt inclusion structure and bearing. Okay, let's see what this is. That sounds a lot of talking, does it actually work? So here's one crystal from the 18th of May 1980. This is the rim and it's a core. This is the anorthite content. Wiggles around a bit here. Are two profiles, but it goes that to that. Then we measure the strontium, blue, and the barium. And then using uh, Oleg's uh, method, we recover the pressure on this scale. Big pressure drop just there, and then a lower pressure. And the temperature in red is a drop. Rises, and so this drop in pressure corresponds to a rise in temperature. This here is the amount of crystal, the amount of melt, the melt fraction, I should expect. The magma is crystallizing, the melt fraction goes down, that's this axis here. And this is the proportion of plagioclase which starts out quite low and then becomes the dominant crystal. So we can do that for many crystals, and we can work out what that's telling us about. The, uh, the magma set process. But we need to key that into some other information, otherwise this is just idle speculation. Well, I mentioned that I analysed a lot of melt inclusions, and this is some published work. I don't have all the melt in find it later find it. That's yesterday. These are the water content of melt inclusions from Mount St. Helens. This is their silica content, and as silica goes up, that's crystallisation. Water goes down. This is a process of decompression crystallisation. We also took individual melt inclusions, and you can see there's a little plagioclase in there. We were able to analyze the plagioclase in the melt and do plagioclase melt thermometry. So for a subset of these inclusions, we were able to measure water and temperature. We know the solubility of water as a function of pressure. So we get a pressure-temperature path that shows, as the pressure goes down, the temperature goes up. And the reason for that, of course, is these are magnets that are driven to crystallize because of decompression. The crystallization releases late T. The late T causes the temperature to rise. And this amount of heating is entirely consistent with the amount of crystallization we see. At the very lowest levels, it's um, driven by uh, micro crystallization. So, this is one record from melt inclusions. I've just described a method from plagioclase crystals. Wouldn't it be great if they agreed? I should have done this some while ago, but I was talking to Oleg about this yesterday. I said, I'm a bit worried, Oleg, that these two records don't agree. So last night I thought, well, I, I'll find the date. I'll plot them up. It would be embarrassing if they didn't. But if they didn't, I wouldn't plot. I wouldn't have shown them, obviously. And they agree pretty well, actually. Um, these, are three crystals, these are four crystals. Cores to rims, pressure and temperature. This is the journey that plagioclase uh, is testifying to in terms of pressure and temperature. This is the journey that plagioclase testifies to from quarter in terms of pressure and melt fraction. This is the story from the melt inclusions. You'll recognize that curve from the last plot. This is how the melt fraction varies, crystallization this way. They were in remarkably good agreement. And it makes me quite confident that plagioclase and melt are reliable witnesses. They both saw the same event, but they saw different parts of the event. The plagioclase is recording something much deeper than the melt inclusions. The melt inclusions record this 200 MPa up to the surface. Plagioclase tells us about deeper in the system. And these pressures here are where we think the mid-crustal reservoir might be. So let's make one more check. Let's see whether the story from the crystals is commensurate with the geophysics. Let's try and complete the, uh, the circle. So in the top left-hand uh, panel there are all of the pressure point 
elements from all of the zones, of all of the crystals we've looked at, turned into depth using that density. I could have changed the density, but we'll stick with this one. So it says a lot of the crystal zones were grown at shallow depth, and there are more up to about 16 kilometers. Let's look at the earthquake distribution over the last uh, 30 years between the Mount St. Helens. There's a lot of, this scale is the same as that. That offset is because these are reference to sea level and this is reference to ground level. So there's a two kilometer offset. The earthquakes have a large peak here, shallow, and they range down to about 20 kilometers. Plagi place goes down to 60. So the seismology and the metrology are agreeing on where magma is. And this is a very large uh, project. I'm not part of this, but this runs out of uh, University of Washington. And they're imaging the, uh, the magmatic system. There's Mount St. Helens. That says shallow magma storage zone. Shallow magma storage zone. And this says deep magma storage zone. Deep magma storage zone. There's a passage between the two. This is reference to sea level again. So that's seven or eight kilometers. And that's the surface. I think we're starting to get petrology and geophysics reconciled. I think that's a really exciting development. Rather than speaking a different language, we're starting to uh, agree. The final thing I'd like to talk about, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I'll try talking at the beginning of your. Mm -hmm. What I'll do is I'll just describe this and then th this part of the talk relates to hydrothermal ore deposits. It segues into what uh, Oleg will be talking about after the break. And so I'll just, I'll just introduce it here and then I'll, 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 I'll stop the talk. Here's how we think these systems work. We think we have a Transcrustal magmatic mush that comprises a series of uh, melt rich lenses, crystal rich lenses, and gas rich lenses. And these accumulate over time and are inherently gravitationally unstable because we've got low density melt and the high density crystals, we've got high low density gas uh, trapped in little lenses. We think that in this system, gas, melt, and crystals can move in a decoupled way, and that periodically the system experiences perhaps quite catastrophic overturn. Something I didn't say about the crystals at Mount St. Helens is those rims, that journey has to have taken less than three years. If you can trace out. We think that the fluxes of gas melt and crystals out of this volcano are decoupled. They move independently of each other. And here's a lovely example from uh, Supria Hills. This is the volcano, um, I this photograph was taken. These little bright spots are fumaroles. They've been there pretty much for the last 10 years or so. They release gas, but the times of gas release are often completely, or typically, completely decoupled from the times of magma release. So this plot at the bottom here, when uh, we see red, the volcano is erupting, green is dormant. Down at the bottom here is the gas flux, this is a dormant period, there's lots of gas coming out, but there's no magma. Here's another dormant period, gas comes out, are high, but there's no magma. Sometimes they're coupled, sometimes they're decoupled. And I think that has implications for the way in which hydrothermal ore deposits are formed. But that's, uh, that, that's something I'll come on to a little bit uh, just before I to talk. So I think the final slide should be... Crystallize um, deep, 
and rarely do we have melt inclusions right in the cores of the crystals. So the melt inclusions tend to occur in these sieve zones around the outside of the crystal. So cores tend to be a small proportion of the crystallizing assemblage, so that reduces the chance of getting an inclusion. But inclusions are very rarely, you can see here, we very rarely have inclusions in here. Inclusions are right in this crystal. They tend to occur just there, and then around here. This rapid decompression right here seems to correlate with the burst of melting point traffic. So I just don't think we have any. I would suggest another yeah. uh, maybe two and a half kilobars, it's an upper level of compression, which can, uh, which is called occurring in, in such weak matter like that. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a certain possibility. There's one, there's one thing I'd say about that. We do have a small number of melting conclusions that found five that have really high carbon dioxide. Now, one could argue that those are artifacts. I've reanalyzed them. They have high CO2 content. They suggest pressures of more than four or five kilograms. I'm not absolutely confident that I trust those melting So you, you may be right. Plagiar phase may be a rather poor container. I have looked at pirate scenes, and I don't find any deep melting food. Amphiboles nearly have always leaked. There are no other means. It's a good point. Either melts weren't getting trapped, or even if they were trapped, they just don't survive. Maybe both. Or maybe both. Yeah. 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 Uh, explain the, the physical state of the host rock. What was the temperature approximately? Why there are no beans? Which, so yeah, that's a that's a very good uh, question. So you're referring to um, those images. That's a. I don't know is the answer. So a very simplistic answer would be to say I have an interlocking network of crystals. I have some interstitial matter. This melt is moving out, a new one is moving in, it's reacting, it's producing amphibole, and then it leaves. Oh, it is a metasomatic, absolutely. Um, one of the things I should say, and, and this, is, this is a sort of a, a, a paradox that's emerged in recent years, is if you look at many volcanic arts, their geochemistry says amphibole fractionation. <coughs> and if you look at their phenocryst contents, they're on the amphibole. And the Antilles is a really good example. So I suspect that all of the melts that eventually leave at the top of this crustal column have somehow experienced some modification by these percolative processes and have precipitated amphibole on the way, even though they no longer saturate with amphibole on eruption. I've really, there are lots of questions like the one you've just asked that I think are relevant here. What is the actual, this is a percolative reactive flow, what happens to trace elements as you, as you move through here? What is, what's the stoichiometry of the reactions, in dissolution, re-precipitation? Um, we see some really weird stuff in the trace elements in these, in these rocks, but that's a whole, I don't really understand those. This is, a, I think this is a metasomatic percolative process, a bit like you get in a, in a, in a metamorphic rock, as you pass a fluid through a porous medium. Yes, yes. Uh, Jan, I was surprised very much uh, when you told that geophysical data showed that practically there, uh, there are no uh, liquid uh, magma chamber for only mesh, or mesh, how you pronounce it. And I, uh, for instance, in uh, polar Siberia, uh, hundreds of dikes, uh, and uh, these dikes consist of uh, olivine crystals and uh, ground mass, just quenched ground mass. Yeah. So it means that uh, we can propose that other crystals uh, dropped or some uh, sure. disappear. Yeah, but olivine here, so the most uh, dense phase. Yeah. So it means that must be big uh, amount of uh, melt. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Fl- I, I see what you're saying. Uh huh. Um, I think we're talking at cross purposes. What I envisage here is this region here has pockets of um, the average melt content is let's say 20%. In places, the melt is 100%, and in places, it's zero. The average, the geophysicists are just telling us about the average, across the average demand. I would anticipate that in here, there are some lenses. Imagine building this from a series of sills. The sill that arrived last week is 100% liquid. Yes. Now, if that can find a way to the surface, if a crack can propagate, it can travel up, crystallizing very little on the way, and it looks like a, a, a dike with sparse finger crisps. Yes. Another part of the system, say here, was injected. It solidified, it got reheated, cooled, reheated, cooled. It spends nearly all of its lifetime, maybe several million years, in a near solid state. And it, I think the important thing is that if we, if we were to zoom in at any point into one of these mush zones, we could access a region that was very, very liquid, or very, very solid, or somewhere in between. Yeah. So I think what you say doesn't, it is not inconsistent with this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What I was saying about geophysics is that if we want to find bodies of magma that are equivalent to the size of erupted volumes of big caldera form volcanoes, there aren't any. The, the volumes of the crust that can be entirely liquid are really small. I think they're just little lenses within, within this, this mush. Maybe in ancient time, Comatiae, definitely liquid, but they of course old. Uh, yeah, I don't want to speculate about the Archean. Yeah, that's, uh, that's yeah, Archean. I'm sticking to the, 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 the modern, the modern, the modern, modern, yes. modern yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.